Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Coast Guard Auxiliary's Tech Talk. Uh, my name is Hiram Escabi. I'm the branch assistant for the youth program staff training branch. But before I introduce our speaker for tonight, let me uh, inform you of the next Tech Talks for June and July. On June 25th, we will have a guest speaker from the uh, National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service to speak about weather satellites, Mr. Ian Zelo. On July 23rd, we will have a guest speaker from Airbus Helicopters, and they will speak about uh, the Coast Guard H-65 helicopters. So Mr. Douglas Grove will be joining us in July. Tonight, we have part two of paddlecraft safety, and we have tonight Dr. Robin Pope. Dr. Pope, take it away. Thank you, sir. Um, so as we said, tonight is going to be part two of a course called Paddle Safe. And in the first part, we talked about some of the hazards that are involved with paddling, uh, talked about some of the, the common types of accidents. And when we look at that, we see that unexpected entry into the water is the most common type of fatality, uh, making up about 85% of, of deaths while paddling, and collisions making up about 11% with the balance being a variety of other things. Um, but the focus, given that, that most paddling deaths occur because of an unexpected entry into the water, is first in preventing that. And that's really what we focused on in the first part of this class. The second part is going to focus more on what happens if you do fall in the water and how do we, how do we take actions on the water to keep that from happening? What do we do when it does happen? And so we mentioned, we kind of wrapped up at the last session saying that paddlers are swimmers who periodically sit in boats. And if we have that assumption, we recognize that paddling and swimming are integrally related. Uh, swimming is part of paddling. It's something we have to expect to, to expect to do. So we have to be prepared to swim. And every bit of boating accident data that I'm familiar with shows that wearing a life jacket is one of the most important, one of the simplest safety steps that a boater can take and that a paddler in particular can take. Um, now, being able to swim is part of this. Wearing a life jacket is part of it. And, and recognizing that carrying a life jacket in the boat, which meets federal carriage requirements, simply isn't enough. A life jacket is like a seatbelt doesn't do much good if you put it on after the event. So we want to wear the life jacket all the time. But that's just the first step. Um, we also want to recognize that water that we're getting into is often colder than we expect. And we've given a, a previous presentation on cold water hazards that I encourage you to read. But I want to go through some of the basic cold water issues right here. Surprisingly, water is considered cold if you're swimming in it if it's below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you don't believe that, I encourage you to get in water that's 55 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very cold very quickly. And if we spend time in it, our bodies cool down. There are four common cold water immersion problems. Uh, and the ones that we really worry about are cold shock, which happens immediately after exposure, and cold incapacitation that can lead to an inability to swim and stay afloat. Hypothermia is something that people often talk about, but it takes a while for our bodies to cool off in water. So if we dress properly, we have flotation, we're likely to stay at the surface where we can be rescued before hypothermia becomes an issue. So four common cold water problems. The first is cold shock. And this is something that happens within seconds of hitting the water. It's believed to occur when the torso, the belly, is exposed to cold water, and it leads to some dramatic physiological effects. Your pulse goes up quite a bit, your blood pressure goes up quite a bit, and your ability to hold your breath goes down. Um, one, one study found that a person that was being studied, and these were all volunteers, uh, when they were exposed to cold water, their breath holding time dropped to one second. 
So if you've gone in the water, your head is underwater for one second, that person might gasp in water and have some trouble. Cold shock typically lasts for a few minutes. And to manage this, we want to get to the surface, float on our back, and gain control of breathing. If you've ever experienced cold shock, you know that gain control of breathing is important. And that's like saying, yeah, just walk on water. Um, just, just launch a rocket to Mars. It's not as easy as it sounds, but it's a critical safety step. And of course, it's much easier to get to the surface to float on your back and gain control of your breathing if you're not worried about staying afloat trying to swim. So life jackets are essential here. The next thing is cold incapacitation, and that's when cooling of your extremities leads to loss of function and swim failure. There's data that shows this can occur in as little as 10 minutes, and the loss of fine motor control can occur even faster. If we're out paddling and we're in cold water and we don't have adequate hand protection, our hands get cold, and that can lead to other problems. If I'm, my hands are cold and the rest of me is warm, I might not be able to hold the paddle when I capsize. I might not be able to roll up. Uh, or if I'm upside down, I might not be able to pop my skirt off. Um, other things we see are that you have difficulty using radios, activating personal locator beacons, uh, doing immediate survival things. So our focus, as soon as we get up to the surface and gain control of our breathing, is to do the most important things first. Uh, if your life jacket's not secure, make sure that's secure. Uh, and then, depending on where you're at, do the next things that are important. If you're on a river, that might mean swimming to shore. If you're two miles offshore, it might mean trying to climb on your boat uh, or activating your personal locator beacon or using your radio to call for help. Uh, we have to, using our knowledge and skills and abilities, we need to decide what that next most critical thing is and do it while we have the ability to do it. The challenge here is once you enter cold incapacitation, once your limbs are no longer able to effectively swim, if you're not wearing a life jacket, you're going to sink. So again, life jacket wear becomes critical here. If you stay in the water long enough, the body's core temperature will cool down and eventually that'll lead to unconsciousness and death. So our goal is to stay out of the water. If we're in the water, get out of the water as soon as possible and then dress to swim. Um, some of the coldest water that I've been in was during swift water rescue training where the water temperature and the air temperature were both 43 degrees Fahrenheit and it rained most of the day. But nobody in the class shivered because everyone is in a dry suit. Everyone had proper hand protection, foot protection and head protection. Um, so actually sweating became more of a problem than shivering. So dress to swim, recognize that water is cold. The last cold water issue we have to deal with is called circumrescue collapse. And that happens when cold blood returns to the body's core from your extremities. And there's been some metabolic changes of that blood. It's uh, Oxygen's been consumed, carbon dioxide and other metabolic products have built up. And what happens is when that cold blood rushes into the body, abnormal heart rhythms can develop and that can be fatal. So we know that when we pull a cold person out of the water, we want to keep them flat. We want to take steps to warm them up. And we want to avoid letting them do any type of physical activity until they're warm. Circumrescue collapse is something that, that's best learned in a wilderness first aid class that addresses cold water problems. And I encourage everyone to take that type of class. We said you want to address the swim. And what does that mean? Well, wicking warm and waterproof. And that's really three layers that we can use. This, in, this image from the Army Corps of Engineers shows kind of how to dress in cold weather and how to dress in warm weather and shows some things that are not a great idea. Um, we see on this side, the person that's dressed properly, they've got good scuba type footwear or paddling footwear, it's got insulating layers with uh, over, overlaying uh, waterproof layers. They certainly have their life jacket, and they have some type of hat to keep their head warm. Uh, you can learn more about this by looking at the cold water immersion presentation on the Bee Directorate's website. Um, also, the, uh, the Google Drive that will have this at the end uh, will also have a, a cold water presentation. In it. So we you know cold water, and we know that water is difficult to breathe, but what are some of the conditions that will make us end up in the water? And for new paddlers, 
riskier conditions include waves greater than one foot, and particularly if those are breaking waves. Wind speed greater than 10 knots, particularly if it's blowing you away from the shore. Many beginning paddlers have difficulty overcoming 10 knot or stronger winds, uh, and sometimes even uh, less strong winds. So if that wind is blowing you away from shore, it's taking you from safety into danger, it becomes an issue. Weather conditions, including lightning, heavy fog, rain, hail, snow, um, all of those are things that we want to be very careful about. And essentially, if you would be worried hiking in it, you should be even more worried paddling in it. And then finally, water conditions. So we, we mentioned cold water, currents faster than one knot, rapids, and then debris in the water can create some additional hazards. So if we look at those one, one at a time, we can see that waves can be really fun for a well-prepared paddler, but if you're not prepared, they can lead to capsize. So we want to avoid higher waves, and this is about a three-foot wave. Uh, you can see, and this is me, uh, my boat is, is bright orange, easy to see. My helmet is red, and my life jacket is kind of lime greenish yellow. All of these are really easy to colors to see. If something happens to me and the Coast Guard needs to rescue me, or if there are other boaters out and I want them to see me to avoid problems. So wind can create waves and it can also push boaters offshore. Uh, therefore, you want to start paddling trips into the wind so that when you're tired, the wind is going to push you back to shore. One of the challenges, of course, is that wind changes direction. So if we paddle into the wind, we may end up paddling into the wind coming back at the end of the trip. Um, something we want to be prepared for. We really do want to be prepared to not get blown out to sea. Uh, right here, this is in Bogue Inlet, North Carolina, and uh, we'd have to look at latitude and longitude, but uh, either uh, North Africa or Europe are the next destination if you get blown out to sea, unless you run into the Canary Islands first. So we want to really be careful about wind direction. And if, if wind direction is not doing what we want, we want to change our plans. Just as scouts have to be careful of lightning when they're, they're on land, we have to be careful of lightning on the water. Uh, people do get zapped by lightning. And that's a bad thing if you're on the water. Um, but lightning often is accompanied by high winds and heavy rain, which make you even more miserable. So if we look at all the data on thunderstorms and lightning, there's been a lot of discussion and, and people can sit down and, and debate for a long time. But I think pretty clearly we know that the only safe place to be in a thunderstorm is someplace else. Uh, if you're in a thunderstorm on the water, you're just at tremendous risk. So the rule of staying off the water for 30 minutes after the last time you see lightning or hear thunder is the safest uh, goal. Of course, if you're five miles offshore in a sea kayak and the thunderstorm comes up, that's hard to do. If you're in a, a river and you're paddling downstream and it's getting dark and you're nowhere near your takeout, that becomes challenging to do. And the way to handle that is through prior preparation. Make sure that you have taken the time to know what the weather is doing and don't put yourself in a hazardous situation. So we mentioned debris in the water can be a hazard and, and debris are, is often called strainers. Um, we think of trees, but cars in the water, riprap, rocks can also create strainers. And a strainer is anything that lets water go through, but does not let you, your boat, your gear go through. So see on the slide, strainers, uh, down trees are the most common type of strainer, but in high water and flood situations, as you see in this uh, scenario from a rescue class, trees that are normally upright and out of the water can form strainers. And we can see here the green boat uh, that is pinned against a number of trees with a, uh, an instructor in it simulating a pin and then a group of rescuers trying to help him out. Strainers can collect on the upstream face of bridge pilings. You can see these large trees sitting on the face of a, a bridge in the Nolichucky River. And you can see some of them are wrapped around the bridge piling so that the strainer can extend far downstream. The expert way to manage all of this is to stay well away from it. Uh, there is no safe way to paddle into a strainer. So uh, just as lightning, the best way to deal with it is to not be around. 
we know that that unexpected entry into the water is a real challenge. And if we're swimming, particularly in, a, in the, uh, the, the rivers, but also in the ocean, the goal is to keep our body at the surface of the water. Uh, this is a, a, a river, the Nantahala River in western North Carolina, and there's all sorts of stuff down on the bottom. People fish there. There are rocks and sticks and things that we just don't want to step on. So we want to keep our feet up. If we're with our boat, we also want to make sure that that boat is downstream of us, because if you hit a rock and then the boat hits you, you get squished. So this is a uh, this is taken during a rescue class. You can see the blue boat. A little bit harder to see is that this blob right here is a person. It's an instructor. And really the only thing that's clear is his hand and maybe the little yellow ball on his rescue vest. Uh, it's hard to tell that that's a person because they're wearing dark clothes. If you contrast that with the bright clothes that I had on, it shows the importance of wearing bright clothes, makes it much easier to find you in the water. Another man-made feature we might have to deal with are low head dams. And these are also called drowning machines. What happens is the water comes off the top of the dam, flows down and then recirculates. And if, if you look at this, you can see that there's a distinct white line between the frothy water and the downstream water. The actual boil line is out here. So water this side is going downstream, and here it's actually flowing back into the dam and getting recirculated. Um, and if you try to use your imagination, you can kind of see there's a little depression through here uh, showing that separation line. That is taller than the height of the dam. And this is about a six foot high dam. The backwash extends down about 15 feet. If you were to paddle over this, you could have a disastrous experience. So the expert way to deal with low head dams is to walk around them and never run them. So other boats can be a significant hazard. We really want to watch out for them. Commercial traffic, ferries and other commercial vessels in particular have to keep to a schedule. If we get in their way, then we might get in trouble. And just like stepping in front of a bus, even if you have right of way, it doesn't really matter after the bus has hit you. If you're in a kayak and you have right of way, it doesn't matter after the ferries hit you. So we want to make sure that other boaters can see us. And you can see here the bright green sleeves, the white paddle, and the white hat show up very distinctly against the background. They make it much easier to see, as does the, the brightly colored boats. There are very few collisions that happen between paddlers and power boaters that have lethal consequences, but it's disturbing how many power boaters run over paddlers. And then after they do it, they say, I never saw them or I didn't see them until it was too late to turn. And you know, they're telling the truth. They, the paddlers were not taking actions to make sure that they were visible. The paddlers were in areas where there's a lot of powerboat traffic and they got hit. It's like someone playing in the road. So if you're in a, a kayak, canoe, stand up paddleboard, don't play in the main traffic. Um, and as I said, they're uh, disturbingly common, even though they're often not lethal. We want to assume that power boats don't see us and will not take steps to, to avoid a collision. So we want to avoid areas where they're likely to, found, to be found, particularly channels and boat ramps. So we talked about some of the hazards. We also want to think about how to handle our boat, because if we handle our boats correctly, we're unlikely to end up in the water. And each boat has its own handling characteristics. Um, I recommend you take a hands-on boating class, but there are some general fundamental principles that we want to follow. And the first is that we want to load the boat so it has an even trim, both when we start out and more importantly, when we sit in it. So you can see these two gentlemen sitting in their kayaks and they're both sitting pretty even in the water. And that's what we want. Pardon. Um, we want to remember that a boat that is overloaded or improperly loaded is less stable and more likely to capsize. So you can imagine that if David, um, which is my son, who's a former Sea Scout, was sitting in here and there was a lot of weight in the stern, it would lift the nose of his boat. And as he entered a rapid, it might make him more likely to, to capsize. If Tom, a friend of mine who's sitting next to him, cursor, uh, had the boat heavily weighted on the uh, starboard side and not on the port, 
he might end up capsizing as he made a starboard turn because the boat would be more more stable there, uh, being weighted down there. So, as I said, each boat's different, but the basic boat handling principles are the same. Sit, kneel, or stand in the boat, and on a stand-up paddleboard, we do stand on the boat, but do it so it keeps an even trim. We want to keep our posture upright with your head above your bottom. If you lean out to the side, that can make the boat unstable. We generally keep our elbows below our chin and in front of the body in kind of a push-up position because that's where we're strongest. That's where we're least likely to injure our shoulders. We engage the paddle in the water with minimal splash. And even though it's fun to splash people when we paddle, if we want to get power, splashing is inefficiency. That's bubbles that we're creating rather than applying power to the water. So minimal splash is what we want. And then look where you want to go. Uh, we know that if you're walking or driving, if you look over your shoulder, you're not looking where you want to go. You tend to turn. Same thing for paddling. Look where you want to go. So we know that operator inexperience is a common contributing factor to both fatal and non-fatal boating accidents, and in particular to paddling accidents. So paddling is a hands-on in-water skill. And the way to get experience is to go out and get experience. You should go and train on the water. What you're hearing here is a good base that'll help you make good decisions about when to get on the water. But we want you to go out and build on that, that knowledge by obtaining instruction from a qualified instructor. Uh, instructor. We also want to think that paddling is a lifelong activity, and that's important for two reasons. One, we can always learn new things. We can always gain experience. We can always work with knowledgeable instructors and mentors. But it also means that if I'm going to be doing this for my entire life, if the water conditions are bad today, I can always come back tomorrow. Being flexible, making sure that we pay attention to the conditions always includes the opportunity to not get on the water because the, the water conditions are not what we expect or my physical condition is not what I expect. If I get to the water and I don't feel good, uh, I just don't have any energy because I've been working too many hours during the week, maybe I take uh, an easier trip or maybe I go home and uh, take a rest before I get on the water. That concept is that paddling is a single person activity. We are each the captain of our own vessel. Uh, and as a captain, we have to take responsibility for ourselves and our vessel. But paddling is also generally a group activity. We want to remember that somebody helped us start out, so we pay it forward by helping others on the water. We also remember that it is safer and more fun to paddle as part of a group. If I'm part of a group, we can share the fun experiences. But also, if I get in trouble, there's somebody there to help. So instruction helps you learn new skills, gain experience, meet new paddlers, and fundamentally have more fun on the water. But if you, even if you pay full attention to this, even if you do everything right, bad stuff sometimes happens. So we want to think about how to respond to a paddling accident. And we're going to go through some principles and priorities, talk about self-rescue, assisting others, and then seeking outside help. Best rescue is the one that's never needed. So we focus on doing things to take steps so that we never need a rescue. But if it does need to happen, the ideal rescue has three criteria. First, it's as safe as possible. It keeps both the rescuers and the rescue subjects as safe as we can. We want it to be as simple as possible because we know in stressful situations, our performance gets worse. If we do things that are very complicated require a lot of thought and fine motion, we are more likely to have a failure than if we do things that are simple and straightforward and that we have practiced repeatedly. And then finally, in the water environment, we want a rescue that's speedy because time matters. Particularly if someone's head is underwater, we need to make sure that we can get them heads up until we can get them further rescued. But that might mean we only have 20 or 30 seconds to get the initial rescue implemented. So ideally, the rescue is all three. It's safe, simple, and speedy. We don't always get that. Rescues that include two out of three are pretty common. Rescues that only include one or none of these criteria, they're slow, dangerous, and complicated, do happen. But we want to avoid making that our primary option 
Instead, it should be a backup option after safe, simple, and speedy things have not worked. When we conduct rescues, we have some priorities. And the most important person in a rescue is me. That sounds selfish, but if I get into trouble, we start out with one rescuer, me, and one victim, the person in the water. I get into trouble, and now there are no rescuers and two victims, and that's just awful rescue math. So I always take care of myself first. Then we want to look out for our group, because if our group gets hurt, they're just going to add to the problem. We then think about everybody else in the world. That can mean that people are floating downstream, people paddling or boating into our rescue. It could mean bystanders on shore. We want to make sure that they don't get involved and don't complicate the rescue. After we deal with all these people that are not having a problem, we then think about the rescue subject. And that sounds very callous, but again, we want to have good rescue math where we don't make the situation worse by adding to the victims. This, the rescue subject is the most important thing to rescue. And then we think about big gear, such as boats and paddles. And then we think about little gear. Little gear might be water bottles and dry bags and things of that nature. But little gear might become suddenly much more important if you're on a long trip and that dry bag has the car keys in it. So be aware of, of the value of little gear and make sure you rescue it if necessary. I put pets in. Put pets and other animals in here, and I don't know where they fit. They do fit somewhere between people, and there's something we need to consider because people go in the water to rescue their pets, and their pets swim to safety and the rescuers don't. But we need to think about them. Um, we need to evaluate it and decide if we're going to go after them immediately after a person uh, or after big gear or after little gear. Um, for many people, pets are part of the family, and people are willing to put themselves at significant risk to, risk to rescue their pets. We want to think about that both for ourselves and for the subject that we just brought to shore. If we put a lot of effort to bring them to shore, we don't really want them to get back in the water, back into a dangerous environment. So as we look at what to do, it's been suggested that we should ask two questions of ourselves. And the first is, can I do the rescue? Do I and my fellow rescuers have the equipment, the knowledge, the abilities, the, the physical and mental abilities to actually perform the planned rescue? Because if I don't have the ability, there's no reason to try the rescue. So we find something that we can do. And then we ask ourselves, should I do the rescue? What are the consequences of trying the rescue and failing? So for example, if we have a giant waterfall, a 50 foot waterfall, and someone is in trouble at the top of the waterfall, there's some pretty significant hazards of failing the rescue. I might swim over the waterfall. On the other hand, if a subject has gone over the waterfall and is now down in a giant pool, essentially a huge lake, the risks are much lower and I might be willing to go in and put myself at a higher risk because the consequences of failure are much lower. We want to act quickly, but we do want to take time to consider several options and consider, is there a lower risk option than what we've initially thought about? Can we tweak the rescue to make it safer both for the rescuers and for the rescue subject? Because the rescue subject is tired, they're cold, they've been beaten up by the rescue, uh, you know, they're in the water uh, dealing with rocks and other hazards. We don't want to put them out where they have to swim and take care of themselves and assume that they're going to be as fresh as they were when they first got on the water. So worry about the risk to ourselves and to the, the rescue subject. And one thing to think about is what are the consequences of waiting? Sometimes people really rush into a rescue when, in fact, if they had waited, the water level would have dropped, the tide would have gone out, the, the tide would have changed direction. So what happens if we wait? And what happens if while waiting, we seek out additional help? So a person might be stranded on a small island and it would be difficult for us to paddle out and rescue them, but maybe a larger boat, a raft comes up, or if we're on the coast, a power boat or even a helicopter comes in. So we wanna think about, can we get additional help and what's the value of that additional help? 
Self-rescue is the best rescue if you can't avoid the rescue. So some basic concepts for self-rescue. If I'm the one in trouble, first thing to do is get to the surface. Second thing to do is hold on to my gear because I need my boat and paddle to continue on the trip. Otherwise, I'm walking. And then I want to think about my options. Can I empty the boat and re-enter in deep water? That's an important sea kayaking skill, lake paddling skill. If I'm a mile offshore, I better be able to get back in my boat because swimming it to shore is going to be a challenge. Um, if I'm in a river, swimming to shore might become much more common. And then is there a way to tow the boat to shore? If I can't rescue, then I'm hoping that somebody else rescues me. And we have a whole host of rescue options. The first one is to simply speak to the subject. Hey, swim to me, swim in this direction. Um, heard one case where a lifeguard said, hey, stand up, um, because they were in five feet of water and scared, but they were tall enough to simply stand up on the bottom. So speaking to the person that's in trouble, giving them some direction will help them rescue themselves. If that doesn't work, maybe we reach out to the subject with a hand or a paddle uh, or the end of a boat or something of that nature. We can then think about throwing something to the subject. And we often think about throwing a rope out to the subject so the person can grab onto it and be pulled into shore. We can row out to the subject in a boat that doesn't easily capsize, such as a raft or a rowboat. Or we can get in the water and actually help the subject. And we put kayaks, canoes, and stand-up paddle boards as a go rescue rather than a, a row rescue because almost anybody can capsize me if they really try hard enough. Um, it's just very easy to capsize somebody in a kayak canoe or stand up paddle board. So that rescuer is at much higher risk. Recognize that row and go rescues place the rescuer at a much higher risk than other options. So we don't want to attempt these unless you're properly trained and experienced. The last way to rescue is to get outside help, such as a professional rescue team or a helicopter. And the challenge there is it takes time, but it might be the only option we have. It's important to remember that this is, this is presented as a way to remember it. It's not necessarily the, the order of things that we might do. If I'm paddling next to somebody and they capsize, I might be able to help them come up right away, something that's simple and speedy, but maybe not as safe as other options for me. But because it's simple and speedy, I get that subject up and moving downstream quickly. In other cases, I might be on shore eating lunch and I have a throw rope that I can throw out to the subject. So we want to assess this entire list and then decide what is most appropriate for the situation, trying to balance speed, safety, simplicity, and the likelihood of success. So said, speaking to a subject might be all that's needed. Telling the paddler which direction to swim might be the only thing you have to do. We remember that the, the swimmer may only be able to see a few inches above the water, whereas if I'm on shore, I can see a much better picture. So telling them what to do might be life-saving. It also means that that subject can't really attack me. They can't try to use me as a raft. So I want to think about allowing them to swim to me. Reaching and throwing rescues often start with a rescuer on a shore or in a larger boat uh, because you need a, a stable place to work from. Row and go rescues get much more complicated. And, and a couple of rescues we can talk about. First, a towing rescue. And here we've got a gentleman towing another boater uh, who is holding on to their boat and the rescuer's boat. And you can see here, everybody is relaxed and calm. The subject is cooperative. They, they should be kicking and helping things come into shore. There are a variety of more complex toes that you would learn in a hands-on class. And I, again, I encourage you to learn to, to do those more advanced rescues. The person in the water can help open their boat, uh, em empty their boat rather. You can see the, uh, the two scouts here emptying the orange kayak and they're assisting each other. The next step after that boat is emptied is to flip it over and then to help each other climb in. And there are a variety of techniques that you can use to climb in. Here, one of the rescuers is stabilizing the other person's boat to make sure that it doesn't capsize while the person climbs in. 
If none of that works, we might seek about look at seeking outside help. And the first thing we need to think about is a communication device. How do we get outside help? Lots of options. Important to remember that they all work sometimes. None of them work all the time, which means we need to know where we are first so we can tell the rescuers where to go, but also if we need to run out and seek outside help, we want to know where those access points are, know how we can evacuate, and know how we can bring rescuers into the scene. So kind of a wrap up, paddling is generally very safe. There are about 35 million paddlers in the US, about 150 paddling fatalities each year, and a few hundred reported accidents, although we think there are more than that. But even if we only find 10% of the accidents or even 1% of the accidents, the data shows that paddling is very safe and most paddlers will never have a serious accident. But those accidents are tragedies, and they're tragedies that are preventable with simple steps. So we can make steps to make it safer because safer paddling is more fun. So I'd like to leave you with 12 take-home points. The first is understand the risks. The big risks are unexpected entry into the water, and then less so collisions. The big contributing factors for paddling accidents are hazardous waters, inexperience, weather, and improper and uh, overload in the boat. So if we can manage those, then they're less likely to be problems. Before we get on the, the water, we want to evaluate what we know, what we can do, and what equipment we have. Part of that is checking the equipment, making sure it's in good condition. Part of it might be looking at guidebooks. Part of it might be getting classes. But evaluate what you know and what you can do and then step three is plan a trip within your capabilities that avoids hazards and finds fun. At the same time, we want to be flexible. When we plan the trip, we expect certain conditions. When we get to the water, those conditions might change, which means we change our plans. Uh, I was paddling a, a river that was very, very high. Uh, my group was very experienced. We had a good time on it. But as we were about to get on the water, we saw another group that was much less experienced. And we were pretty concerned about them, and they were apparently pretty concerned too, because after looking at the river and having some some talks and looking at the river again and having more talks, we saw them get back in their car and drive off and later found out that they went to a different section of water that was more within their skill limits. So they had fun by, because they were flexible. We want a boat in a group. There are a tragic number of accidents where a single boater is found face down, boat in a group so you've got somebody to rescue you. In the first part, I talked a lot about the idea of paddle sober, and that's really drive to the water sober, paddle sober, and drive home sober. With scouts and with members of the auxiliary, that should be a no-brainer. That's what we are not just supposed to do, it's what we're required to do. But we know when we look at the overall boating community, the most common contributing factor for fatal boating accidents across all types of boating is alcohol consumption. So make sure that you're setting an example for other people that maybe haven't heard this course. Number seven, recognize and avoid hazards on the water. And those include weather conditions and water conditions. And then learn how to handle your boat to avoid unexpected out-of-boat experiences learn how to, how to avoid these hazards and how to respond to them. Dress to swim, wear your life jacket, wear sun protection, wear footwear, because if you swim to shore and you have to walk somewhere and there's broken shells or glass or sharp rocks, you just can't get there. Footwear is really armor so that when I'm in trouble, you can run downstream, run across the beach to help me. So dress to swim, Always wear your life jacket every time you paddle. 10 is learn to self-rescue. 11, learn to rescue others. And then finally, develop skills and gain experience through instruction and mentorship. Um, take home message, safer paddling is more fun. So what next? Well, go out and get some on-water instruction for the boat you want to paddle. Find a paddling group and use the risk management steps presented in this class to stay safer and have more fun on the water. And I'll be happy to answer any questions.
All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robin. Let's see. I have uh, just checking the chat box and questions. Uh, earlier in the, your presentation, you mentioned about dams and, and the yeah. dangerous effects that the dams can do to a yes. kind of craft. Uh, where can you find information uh, on the body of water uh, where those dams are? What charts uh, do you go and check for that? The, the best guide are going to be local guidebooks. Some maps and charts will show them, but local guides and local paddling knowledge is probably the best thing to have. Many low head dams, but certainly not all, will have warning signs that, that show that you know a dam may be coming up. Um, but part of it is to to look at those guidebooks and and understand what's there. And part of it is to recognize what low head dams look like from an upstream perspective. Um, and I'm actually going to stop sharing and I'm going to pull up a picture of a low head dam. And then this will take a minute. So I'm going to come back and share my screen again. All right. So the the blowhead dam that I showed before uh, was taken from downstream. This is the same dam from upstream. And what we're looking for is what's called a horizon line. You can see there's a flat line through here. And there's no waves. There's no ripples. It's a subtle feature. But if you look out to the side, you can see that the banks drop on either side and the tree height drops. When you see that, we want to get out, take a look at the, the feature. And it might be that the feature is benign, or in this case, it might be that there's a, a six foot low head dam right below us. All right. Thank, thank you, Robin. Another question oh. uh, for a novice youth uh, paddlecraft. Uh, individual what recommendations of paddlecraft size for youth because they all they come in different sizes so what they recommendation do. for a youth so if you look at the manufacturer's recommendation they will generally have a weight range the the smallest vessel smallest kayak i'm aware of uh, is a boat called a fun one that was made by Jackson kayak for several years and the the lowest weight for it was supposed to be 35 pounds my son started at about 35 pounds in age four in that boat and it fit him perfectly he, as they get bigger they have a higher weight capacity what I'd like to what I'd suggest is one make sure that the scout can get into the boat uh, we've had some scouts who try to wedge themselves in boats that are, are just not big enough for them uh, to make sure that it's the appropriate vessel for the conditions you want to paddle. And three, um, make sure that it's accessible. So with all of that, you know, the most common kayak sizes are going to be eight to 10 feet for youth. And then as you look at more sea kayaking, uh, they tend to get longer because longer boats are faster. In whitewater, they actually tend to get shorter because shorter boats are more maneuverable. But 10 feet is probably the most common size of a boat. And that covers lots of sit on tops and uh, beginner friendly sit in kayaks. All right. Thank you, Robin. Uh, another question is uh, water rescue. Uh, yes. What type? of rescue techniques if if an individual is in the water uh, without a 
life vest on. And then the same thing applies with a person with a life vest. What techniques would you use to get them out of the water or to shore? It, yeah. So it depends on where I'm at. If I'm on shore, then a throw rope, which is uh, typically a 50 to 70 foot bag of floating rope that you can throw out to a subject in the water is a very valuable rescue tool. It's something that every paddler should have. If you are in the water with them and they don't have a life jacket, then they really put you as the boater at risk and you have to assess your own skills, your ability to safely make contact with them and your ability to then paddle with them to shore. But there are ways to tow swimmers using your boat. Um, generally much safer if the, the swimmer has done this before and is wearing a life jacket and is cooperative but you can have them hold onto the boat and tow them, recognizing that that puts you at much higher risk. Uh, you can, if you have a, a tow system, you can give them the line and maintain some separation between you and the subject in the water so that they can't climb up to you. Right. And then there, there, are, there are lifeguard style techniques, but in it, it really depends on the conditions you're in. If you're in, Whitewater, those are really advanced lifeguarding techniques. If you're in surf, they're advanced lifeguarding techniques. If you're in a pool or a lake, then that fits in with uh, the scouting or BSA lifeguard and BSA lifesaving merit badge. All right. Thank you, Robin. And another question. In the highways, we've seen all kinds of ways uh, people taking their canoe or or paddle craft uh, to water from on top of the vehicle or in the, in the bed of a pickup truck, which yes. is the best way to transport the paddle craft. The best way is the way that is secure. Um, let me pull up another picture. Ideally, regardless of how you are, of regardless of what type of vessel you're transporting, the regardless of what type of vessel you're transporting, you want to have a bow and a stern line. So I've got a picture here. Uh, this is a kayak, but a canoe would be the same way. I've got a bow line, and even though this is the stern of the boat, we call it a bow line because it's running to the bow of the car. So it attaches from the boat to the front of the vehicle, the stern line attaching from the boat down to the, the stern of the, the vehicle, and then cross straps that are across it. So the cross straps secure the, the vessel to the, to the racks, and then the bow and stern lines attach the boat to the vehicle, and that generally makes a very secure attachment. Uh, in a truck, I, I would think about having this line, instead of going to the front of the vehicle, if it's in the bed of the truck, there should be tie downs in the truck and, and tying it directly to a tie down, tying the, the back of the boat to the, the tailgate or to the bumper of the vehicle. Um, but really making sure that you've got multiple points of contact, assuming that one of them is going to fail and you don't want your boat to go coming off your car. You know, this is about a 50 pound boat. So whoever's behind me does not want a 50 pound torpedo coming at them. And the other thing I would add is that if you want to have some additional security, both for theft and for ensuring the boat stays on the vehicle, adding a chain or a cable lock is a good option. If I had a chain on this or cable lock, even if the boat completely came off the rack, it would be secured to my vehicle and it might damage my vehicle, but I'd rather that than hurting somebody else. All right. Thank you, Robin. I think that's the last uh, question that okay. has, come, has come up. So again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate your time and effort for uh, presenting this tonight. To us. You're welcome.
I'd like to remind everyone uh, that uh, we have next month's uh, Tech Talk uh, Weather Satellites by Mr. Ian Zillow uh, from NOAA's National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service. That should be a very interesting uh, Tech Talk. And then also in July 23rd, uh, Mr. Douglas Grove uh, from Airbus Helicopters. He'll be speaking about the Coast Guard H-65 helicopters. Thank you again uh, for joining us tonight, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.